Would you bow with me as we pray together this morning? Father God, as we lift all of the people all over the United States that have been going through all of the tornadoes, and Father, for those that have been hurt, injured, for those that have died, for these families, we lift them all to you. For these cities, Father, that have been crushed by all of this uh, activity, God, how I pray for them and the rebuilding of their towns, their cities, their homes, their lives. Pray for your grace, your peace, your help, your sustaining power to be with them, oh God, during such times as these. Father, this morning as we pause here for the next few minutes to speak once again about living the Spirit-filled life and to look at the breath of God today from the book of John, I pray, oh God, that you would burn it indelibly upon our hearts and lives, the importance of what the Holy Spirit means in our hearts and lives. Father, as the Holy Spirit leads us this morning and guides us into all truth today, I pray, O oh Father, that you would speak to hearts everywhere. Holy Spirit of the living God, fall fresh and anew on each one of us. And how I pray as the Holy Spirit moves throughout the earth, bringing people to places of conviction and repentance and conversion, O oh God, help us that we would carry out the Great Commission and the great commandment that you left us to do upon this earth. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time together. Be with us, tabernacle in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. This morning, once again, sermon number two on the spirit feel life. I'm convinced of this one thing that we as Christians, once we receive Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, the journey just begins. And I realize that it's so easy in the world that you and I live in, in a world that is filled with so much conflict and divisiveness, a world that is filled with all kinds of information coming in all directions in our lives. It's easy for us oftentimes to allow the power of our flesh to take over rather than to allow the Holy Spirit who lives within our heart to take control of our hearts and lives. And so this morning, I want to speak upon the breath of God the breath of God from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 22 in the New Living, uh, uh, the New King James Version of the Bible. We read these words, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, young people, that was on that Easter Sunday morning, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, the, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. In John's gospel here, one of those disciples of Jesus, the one who was with Jesus to the very end at the cross, uh, John records the resurrection. He uh, sa tells us that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. Those disciples were locked away behind closed doors. Obviously, they had heard Jesus speak that he would rise again, but somewhere in their humanity, they failed to get that message. And although they had been told of the resurrection of the Lord by Mary Magdalene on that Sunday morning and several of the other women, they were still not fully convinced that the Lord had risen from the dead. Now, now that they see Jesus 
and they are excited. They see his hands and they see his side. They're convinced that he is who he said he was, and he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so send I you. Now, I don't know about you, but just in our humanity, can you only imagine the weight of this responsibility? The responsibility uh, these disciples must have a tremendous feeling of inadequacy. Jesus was alive. He's resurrected from the grave. Now he tells us he's going back to the Father in heaven, and he is saying to those disciples, those followers of his, just as God sent me into the world to be the faithful witness, I'm going back to the Father and I'm sending you. So those disciples on that Sunday evening of resurrection, they must have thought in their hearts and in their minds, what a terrifying thing. Jesus, who has been with us, who's walked with us, who's led us every step of the way, he is going away and he's leaving the ministry with us to carry out his plan, to share the gospel and to preach the good news of salvation. And it is going to be left in our hands to carry that out. If you can only imagine, if you would have been there 2,000 years ago, maybe you, like they, would have felt so inadequate to think that they were going to have to take on this ministry, this responsibility. How on earth would they do that? And the Bible tells us Jesus breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus was reassuring them that they would not have to rely upon their own strength. They would not have to rely upon their own abilities, uh, uh, but they would be empowered the sa- in the same way that Jesus was empowered when he ministered on the earth. The Holy Spirit had been promised by the Father. And uh, as he breathed upon them, they would be endued with this power from on high, the Holy Spirit. And uh, Jesus, this was a foretaste of the day of Pentecost when the promise, the Holy Spirit, would be poured out and the Holy Spirit would come in like a mighty rushing wind and it would descend upon those that were gathered there on the day of Pentecost. And that wind would be the Spirit of God and it would come like a tornado into that room and they would all be filled with the Holy Spirit and they would be baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ and they would be filled with the Holy Spirit so they would be empowered, they would be enabled to go and to witness in their world. And when you look at this passage in the book of John where it says Jesus breathed on them, that word breathe there is the same word that uh, uh, as the word Holy Spirit or as the word spirit. It's the Greek word from which we get uh, pneumonia. We get our word pneumatic. The word is anuma. Jesus breathed on them, and it comes from that Greek root word pneuma, and it means to breathe on or to blow. Sometimes it's presented in the Scripture as the wind of God blowing upon his people. Jesus breathed on them to symbolize that the breath of God would come over them and come into them and empower them with this Spirit of God to carry out this great commission to go tell others of the good news of the gospel. So when you think about the breath of Jesus as he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Later, Jesus would tell those disciples to stay there in Jerusalem and wait until the promise would come. That would be on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came there in Acts chapter 2 and Peter would be preaching the good news of the gospel. I want to share with all of us here this morning the work of the Holy Spirit as he breathed upon this world as the Holy Spirit breathed upon mankind and and breathed upon the church in these last 
2,000 years, but I want to go back further than that. It was the breath of God that created a world. And the first thing I want us to see this morning, the Holy Spirit's work of creation. The Holy Spirit's work of creation. In the book of Genesis, chapter 1 and verse 2, we are introduced to the person of the Holy Spirit. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The Holy Spirit, young people, didn't begin in that upper room 2,000 years ago. The Holy Spirit had been at work since the very beginning. You see, it was his work, the work of creation, that brought this world into existence. Consider this, the second verse of the Bible in the book of Genesis has a reference here to the Spirit of God hovering around the waters. That Hebrew word hovered there. That, that word means like a, a chicken that hovers over her little chicks in a nest. The Spirit of God was brooding over the waters. And uh, when you see verse 1 of Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God did what? Created the heavens and the earth. I believe that God created a perfect creation. But between Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, and Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, between the first and the second verse of chapter 1 of Genesis, I believe there's something happened. There are a lot of uh, Bible scholars that believe that before verse 2 was written in Genesis 1, that Lucifer, who became known to us as the devil or Satan, Lucifer rebelled against God. He was the son of the morning. He was the praise leader, the worship leader of heaven. And in his pride, he said, I'll be like the most high God. And according to the Bible, when Lucifer rebelled against God, one-third of the angels that God created, those evil angels, those evil spirits, uh, they went with Satan to do all of the things he's done since then. And because of that, Genesis 1 verse 2 says, darkness was on the face of the deep, the earth was without form and void. Lucifer's rebellion according to many Bible scholars, caused a cataclysmic, chaotic situation. The perfect world that God made was affected by the rebellion of sin. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, we read that God began a new creation process. The Spirit of God hovered over the waters. It hovered over the chaotic world there. And what happened next is that the breath of God moved upon this world that was without form and void. And the Bible gives many Old Testament references uh, how the Spirit of God, the breath of God, moved upon this chaos and void and brought about a wonderful world, a beautiful world of symmetry and a world of purpose. The Spirit of God blew upon the, that world and a world was created. In fact, in Genesis chapter, uh, Psalm chapter 104, verse 30 says, you send forth your spirit. They are created and you renew the face of the earth. Psalm 33 and 6 tells us, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. That's the breath of God, young people, the Spirit of God breathing upon chaos and bringing a word of beauty into existence. I want you to think about the beauty of the stars. 150 years before Jesus was ever born, there was a Greek philosopher. He estimated that there were about 1,022 stars. Then 200 years after Christ, Ptolemy had the number up to 1,026 stars. 
It was not until Galileo's invention of the telescope that he said that there had to be millions of stars. And in 1921, there was an American astronomer who said, the stars are innumerable. And now we know that the farther we probe into the depths of space, the more that we know there are galaxies of stars that cannot even be seen by the most powerful telescope that's ever been made available. The Bible says that God hung every one of those stars into space. By the breath of his mouth, they were hung in space and that God not only knows their number, but God has named every one of the stars and he knows their name. And young people, this is the work of the Holy Spirit in creation. Last evening on the Science Channel on television, maybe you're one of those people that have been blessed and gifted with a great scientific mind, but they had astrophysicists on there. And they were showing uh, the stellar heavens out there. And they were speaking about the Spitzer uh, Space Telescope that is somewhere out there, young people orbiting in space. They were speaking about the Chandra uh, Space Telescope out there, that X-ray telescope that's up there in the heavens. That's not even to mention uh, the other uh, telescopes that they have around. But they were looking into the heavens, and it was absolutely mind-boggling to listen to them speak about the things that they can see, but the millions and millions of things that God has created that they'll never be able to plumb with mankind's telescopic lens that he creates. It's absolutely amazing that the breath of God moved and hovered over the earth and brought it all into existence. Young people, uh, uh, they'll try to tell you that the world was a big bang, but I want you to know, I believe, as the Bible says, God created. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit were all involved uh, in the creation of this world. Genesis 2, 7 says, and the Lord God formed man out of the dust. <clears throat> man of the dust of the ground. That would be, young people, your physical nature. And then it says, and he breathed and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That would be your spiritual nature. And man became a living being. That would be your psychological nature. So man is a threefold being. He's made up of body, spirit, and soul. And you and I owe our human existence to God. But we also owe our spiritual existence to God. Jesus said to a man named Nicodemus, Unless a man be born again, he will not see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus inquired about this new birth. Jesus said, this new birth is a spiritual birth. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. And the spirit is like the wind. Last night, the wind was blowing all over states uh, here in our world, in the United States. Now, you and I cannot see the wind. We, we just see the results of the wind. And uh, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit of God. And whenever you think about uh, the Spirit of God, let me tell you, you can see the results of the Spirit of God. You cannot tell where the wind is necessarily coming from. You can't see it, but you see the results of it in the tree limbs blowing and, and the leaves blowing. You can see the results of that. Let me tell you, when the Holy Spirit of God moves over a person's life and comes into a person's life, you can see the results. You can see the results when, um, when somebody uh, no longer is a drug addict and addicted to those things. You can see it when someone is no longer an alcoholic. Uh, you can see it when the abuser becomes gentle. Let me tell you, the, sin, the sinner becomes a saint. You can see it in a person's life, in the change that they make, the walk they walk after the talk they talk, 
Let me tell you, so is everyone that's born of the Spirit of God. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in creation. But not only did God breathe the work of creation, but the Spirit of God also composed a book of Revelation. And secondly, this morning, the Holy Spirit the breath of God, the Holy Spirit's work of inspiration. That is the revelation of the Bible. This book right here that I hold in my hand. Uh, We have 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 books in the New Testament. And young people, according to 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by what? inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. That means teaching, for reproof that, that uh, reproves us when we are wrong, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Let me tell you, uh, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 just tells us, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. You know what that means, young people? Let me tell you, it's a a moved by the Holy Spirit. It's a nautical word that means the sailing of a ship. It refers to the wind blowing into the sails, and it takes the ship to its destination. God used dual authorship. What do I mean by that? Well, there was the authorship of the person who wrote the book, And then there was the Holy Spirit who was the true author. You see, the people that God used to write this book that we call our canon of Scripture, it was the Holy Spirit that wrote it. It was just human instrumentation that penned these wonderful words of life. And I want you to know Acts chapter 1 verse 16 says, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke by the mouth of David concerning Judas who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. John 14, 26. But the helper, who is the helper? We looked at it last week, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Jesus God sent the Holy Spirit. He said, in the name of Jesus there, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Young people, did you wonder how Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Peter, James, Paul, and all of the others, how they remembered the things Jesus did? Uh, How did those gospel writers hear and know what to do? The things that Jesus did, how did they remember them? Well, it's right here. Jesus said, when the Comforter, the Helper, the Holy Spirit is come, he will bring to your mind remembrances of all things that I do. Why did they write the things they wrote about Jesus and not other things? Well, John said at the end of his gospel, if they wrote everything about Jesus, that Jesus did, not all the books in the world could contain what Jesus did upon this earth, but they wrote certain things about the life of Jesus as the Holy Spirit moved upon them, breathed upon them, and they penned the words of revelation, the revealing of the Word of God. How did they do it? Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that moved upon their life. Third and lastly this morning, living the Spirit-filled life. What did the breath of God do? That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's work was in creation. The Holy Spirit's work was the inspiration of the Word of God. But lastly, the Holy Spirit conceived a Savior which was the work of incarnation. I want you to look at that word incarnation. What does that mean? When we speak about the doctrine of incarnation, doctrine, young people, just means teaching. The teaching of the incarnation. What is the incarnation? It was when God stepped out of heaven and came to the earth as a little baby in Bethlehem. He was the incarnate Christ The incarnation, God became flesh and dwelt among us. 
the work of the incarnation. Let me tell you, we're told that uh, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of, of God moved upon Mary. You see, Jesus didn't have an earthly father. Uh, he was not conceived by the seed of an earthly father. Joseph would just be acting as his father, his earthly father. Mary would be the vehicle through which the Holy Spirit came over Mary, and she conceived, Luke 1.34. Luke was a medical doctor, and he wrote that the Virgin Mary would bear the Savior. Here's how it would happen. He said, the Holy Spirit came upon her. The Most High God overshadowed her so that the holy thing that would be conceived in her was from God and was the Son of God. Let me tell you, when Jesus was born, he already had a divine nature. He was already the God-man. Jesus existed from eternity past long before the foundation of the world, along with the Holy Spirit and along with the Father. But when Jesus was born humanly in the womb of Mary, when he was conceived in her womb, Jesus was given a, a human nature. That's why he's called the God-man. He was fully God, fully divine, and yet fully human, yet without sin. Let me tell you, when the Holy Spirit came over Mary and she conceived and the Messiah, Jesus, would come. After Jesus came and, and later after his baptism there in the Jordan River, if you'll remember, his cousin John the Baptist baptized him. And the reason his name is John the Baptist is because John was a baptizer. And that's why his name is John the Baptist. But the Bible says that a dove descended upon Jesus, and Jesus was anointed with power to do the miracles that he did. And then when Jesus was tempted there in the wilderness, the Spirit of God was with him. When Jesus came victoriously out of all of that time of temptation and testing, the Bible says he was led of the Spirit. He was anointed by the Spirit as he began his ministry. Jesus said, nothing that I do, I do on my own. I do all things through the power of the Holy Spirit that's been given unto me. Hebrews 9, 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Romans 8, 11 says, but if the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Let me say this in closing this morning. What does the work of the Holy Spirit do in my life? When Jesus went back to heaven 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus left those followers of his. The Holy Spirit would come upon them on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after resurrection. The Holy Spirit came and fell upon that crowd of 3,000 were saved that day. It's the Holy Spirit, God, Jesus in you, living in you. The Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. When you hear someone say something, does it ring true? Is it, is it true based upon the Bible? Young people, there are lots of movies that are made out there that you can go see. But let me tell you, when you see some of those, you better see do they square with the Bible? Because oftentimes, those screenwriters and those directors and those performers and Hollywood embellishes even upon a religious theme and they take the license and the liberty to add whatever they want to add in a lot of those that are not biblically based. You may have seen the picture of Noah, but let me tell you, if you go back and read the Bible, uh, some of the stuff that was in that uh, was not biblically based. And so, 
How do I know truth? Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. Jesus said, if you want to go to heaven, I'm the way to go. Now, what points me to Jesus? It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. The Holy Spirit convicts us when we're wrong. The Holy Spirit leads us to a place of repentance and to a place of conversion. What does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit was in the work of creation. The Holy Spirit uh, was in the work of the incarnation. The Holy Spirit moved upon Mary and overshadowed her. Let me tell you, what does the Holy Spirit do in my life and in your life today? Let me tell you, we live in a fleshly body, and we can either choose to let the Holy Spirit, if we've been saved, then we make a choice. Will I let the Holy Spirit direct me today, live through me today, lead me today in everything that I do, or will I walk today in the power of my own flesh? You see, without the Holy Spirit, you and I are just dead as far as trying to be a witness for Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit that leads us in to witnessing to someone. Let me tell you, when I'm sitting in my desk and working on a sermon or driving down the road to a hospital or to go do a funeral, all of a sudden names will appear before my mind and I, I know that's the Holy Spirit telling me to pray for that person or it may be the Holy Spirit leading me to call that person and to check on that person. You see, how do I live the Spirit-filled life in a world that is filled with so much corruption, so much immorality, so much sin, so much lying, so much perversions? How do I live life in the body? I live it through the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I live it through the Holy Spirit of God. It's the Holy Spirit that walks with you, that talks with you. It's the Holy Spirit that when you witness to somebody about Jesus, the Holy Spirit's job is to point people to Jesus. And so we, we choose each day, do I let the Holy Spirit live through me today so that others can see the light of Christ in me, that they can see my good works and glorify the Father who lives within my heart and life. Let me tell you, O oh breath of God, fall fresh and anew on us today. Would you stand with me as we pray together? Father God, as we pause this morning, thank you for the breath of God. Thank you, O oh God, for the breath of God that we've looked at today in creation, in the incarnation, in the revelation, inspiration of the Word of God. And Father, I pray that you would help us each day through the Holy Spirit, give us, enable us the power to live a life that would be pleasing in your sight. Father, if there's someone here this morning that needs to trust you, may they just say, Lord, I've sinned and fallen short of your glory. Lord, I realize you came, you died, you shed your blood, you rose from the dead, you ascended back to heaven, you're coming again someday. You want me to have life everlasting, and today I call upon you to forgive my sins and to come into my heart and my life today. Holy Spirit of the living God, there's someone here that prayed that prayer I pray that you would just tell others about Jesus maybe you want to come this morning and share that I've received Christ maybe you're here this morning you need a church home we want to invite you to come and be a part of this great fellowship maybe you just need to come to altar and pray for someone or lift a prayer need to the Lord, whatever the need may be. Let the Holy Spirit move you to make whatever decision Christ would have you make there in the pew or here at the front. Father, we thank you. This is your invitation. In Jesus' name, amen.